All right, we are recording. Hi, I am Tiara Rogers. I am the Director of Extended Learning and Educator Development um, in the Teaching and Learning Department. And I am here um, with two co-presenters today that I will allow to introduce themselves. I'm Carrie Gay, I'm the school psychologist at Meadowbrook, and I've kind of um, been doing a lot of GT things within the district also. I'm Stephanie Merrill, school psychologist at Summit View Elementary School, and the previous psych who was working with Carrie on all of the GT stuff has left our district, so I stepped in to help her out so she didn't have to carry it all. All right, and the three of us will be presenting today and providing an update on the gifted and talented program in the school district of Waukesha. So I'm just going to take a sec and I'm going to share my screen to get our presentation up. Get us in full screen. And get us in presentation mode. All right, so again, as I just shared, we will be um, sharing information today in regards to our gifted and talented program. And I will um, get us going with an overview of the gifted and talented program. So first I wanted to begin with just um, how DPI defines giftedness. Giftedness, intelligence and talent are fluid concepts and may look different in different different contexts and cultures. Even within schools, you will find a range of beliefs about the word gifted, which has become a term with multiple meanings. In Wisconsin, gifted and talented pupils means pupils enrolled in public schools who give evidence of high performance capability in intellectual, creative, artistic, leadership, or specific academic areas, and who need services or activities not ordinarily provided in regular school program in order to fully develop such capabilities. So Wisconsin um, Department of Public Instruction, there is a full state statute around what gifted and talented programming looks like um, or is expected to look like in public schools. So that is hyperlink there um, for your reference, as well as I included a link here just for more information on gifted education in Wisconsin. We will be taking a deeper dive into what it looks like in the school district of Waukesha, but just wanted to start with state statute because it is a requirement um, for us to provide this programming to students. So moving on to um, our gifted and talented program in Waukesha. So I, as I shared earlier, serve as a director in our teaching and learning department. And one of my responsibilities is oversight of the gifted and talented program. However, um, gifted and talented programming looked a lot different in years past. And I would say in the last um, maybe three to five years, there's been a significant shift in um, programming and staffing of the gifted and talented program in our district. So I just wanted to share just a few bullet points in regards to where we've been and where we currently are um, with gifted and talented. So in the past, um, there was a coordinator, so at the district level, there was a coordinator assigned, so they were responsible for program management and the coordination of the gifted and talented program. So they worked collaboratively with each of our um, building sites at the different levels to provide that coordination to make sure information was getting out, um, to make sure you know we were following uh, proper protocols, we were up to date with statute. So we had that dedicated person at the district level to oversee um, this program management and coordination. In addition to having this district coordinator, we also had at each site and each building site, it was dedicated staff um, for gifted and talented programming. So we had staff that helped with the identification process, which we'll go into more detail um, later in our presentation. They assisted with programming and they ultimately just assisted with building level student support and just making sure um, we were again in alignment with DPI and also that we were making sure that those students who were being nominated, we were getting them the testing that needed to happen. We were programming them and we were, you know, uh, obviously what's most important, giving them that additional support to meet their needs. So, as I said, things have definitely shifted and we don't have 
as many resources as, as we had in the past for our gifted and talented program. Um, but of course, we are required to make sure that we are, um, you know, providing resources and, you know, doing what statute requires us to do. So, as I shared before, part of my role is um, taking on responsibility for the program management and coordination, coordination of the gifted and talented program. So I no longer have a coordinator that assists with this work. Um, the responsibility is just, um, again, just a, a responsibility um, assigned um, that I oversee. And also a significant shift uh, from where we were to where we are now. We don't have that dedicated staff um, at the building level to support the gifted and talented program. So now this, work has um, fallen on the shoulders of the building school psychologists, and they are now responsible for this identification process, process um, programming, you know, communicating um, GT plans out to teachers and out to families. Um, so this has been a shift. And when I share some of the data later, you will see because we don't have this dedicated staff, there definitely has been a shift in the number of students that we've had in the past to the number of students who are being like nominated and identified um, currently in our system um, at that um, elementary level. So now I just wanted to shift in sharing some data um, because we all like um, data. We would like to see the numbers. So in our district, um, students begin um, gifted and talented programming in third grade. So that's why you see there, this is for grades three through 12. And we do provide um, GT programming at all levels. So first and foremost, just starting with um, our graphs that we have here, our pie graphs, this basically shows the percentage of gifted and talented students at each of our levels by site. So if we're looking um, overall, um, we currently have 39 elementary um, students across our 12 elementary schools. We have 180 middle school gifted and talented um, students. And then we have currently 237 high school students identified um, as gifted and talented. However, you can see by looking at um, these pie charts here, there is some discrepancies, um, disproportionality um, amongst our schools um, at the different levels. I would say high school is probably the most proportionate um, chart, but if you look at currently at the elementary level, um, Randall STEM and Summit View has the highest percentage of GT students um, in their schools and um, followed by Meadowbrook. And then when we get to our remaining elementary schools, you can see there, um, most of these schools actually have one to two GT students identified in grades three through five. So there's definitely um, some disproportionality amongst um, the students who are being nominated. Um, there's definitely some root causes that I believe attribute to that. Um, but if we're just looking at the raw numbers and looking at um, the data as it is in front of us, you can clearly see um, there is some disparities amongst our elementary schools. When we look at our middle school um, gifted and talented students, um, Butler Middle School actually has um, the most amount of gifted and talented schools, I'm sorry, gifted and talented students. And one of my wonders was looking at the elementary um, pie chart is these higher percentage elementary schools are those direct feeders um, to Butler because Butler does have a significant higher amount of gifted and talented students in compared to the other um, middle schools. So you see we have um, Saratoga STEM, they are just about a quarter, um, 25, just under 25%. Les Paul um, is at 18.9% and Horning is at 17.2%. So that's the breakdown at our middle level. And then as I said earlier with our high school um, GT students, it's a little bit more balanced. However, you can see um, West has the highest percentage of GT students followed by South with 34.2 and then North um, is there at 28.7%. So again, definitely um, digging a little bit deeper into the data. Um, I have some hypotheses of root causes 
to why you know the data um, sits the, where it sits right now. Um, but that will be something that can be shared at a later update. The second um, graphic that I have here is just another pie chart, but this one represents our GT students again in grades three through 12, but now this is broken down um, by race. So now I'm digging into that demographic data a little bit more. So when you're looking at our GT students um, by race, um, it's glaring um, that we have almost 80% of our students are white students um, in our GT programs. Um, also looking at um, this data, there is a significant disproportionality between our white students and our students of, of color with the exception of Asian, with, of our Asian students. So with our Asian students, um, I did actually like take a little deeper dive um, across our, our um, K-12 model. We have 3% um, Asian students um, in our system but they make up 6.7% of our gifted and talented population. So that was something that I found um, interesting. Um, however, if you're looking at our Hispanic students, our black students, our students of two or more races, races or our native Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander students, um, it's a clear disproportionality. And one of the things that I noticed and I pointed out there, um, which was, um, very shocking, I'll just be transparent and honest, um, that we only have two um, black students um, or students identified as black or African American. So in grades three through 12, so out of all, um, it's 480 students total. So out of the 480 students total um, identified as gifted and talented, there are only two black students and only one native Hawaiian um, student identified um, as gifted and talented. So clearly, there's some work to be done. And what I have identified there um, under that second bullet point is this has been um, something that DPI has br um, brought to our district's attention, um, this disproportionality of students being identified um, as gifted and talented. So we clearly know there is some work to do in this area. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I discuss next steps a little bit later. So now we're going to shift our attention to um, gifted and talented programming in our district. And in the um, bottom corner there, that is a hyperlink to our gifted and talented program guide. So the next few slides, we're going to be referencing the program guide. So if you want to open that at a later time, you want to pause and open that now so you can follow along, um, you can. And it is also um, linked in the executive summary for our update today. So I'm going to turn things over to Carrie and Stephanie, and they're going to um, talk us through um, programming in our district. Okay, so our SDW gifted and talenting philosophy is the school district of Waukesha is committed to providing excellence in education for all students. The district acknowledges that students by virtue of their outstanding abilities are capable of high performance. The student, uh, the district recognizes the, dif the right of these gifted and talented students to receive educational opportunities that will complement the level of their capabilities. Therefore, appropriate programming and services will be provided to develop their particular level of giftedness. Gifted programming supports students in five areas. Um, general intellectual ability, specific academic area, and our district looks at math, uh, creativity, leadership, and visual or performing arts. And that's taken from page four of the guide. So on pages five and six, you will see um, a pyramid model of gifted and talented programming. This model is based on the Wisconsin Comprehensive Integrated Gifted Programming Model. Um, and so this was in our original handbook, and so it's followed into the updated manual right now. And essentially it follows um, the MLSS model that we have for any behavioral or academic concerns. Um, so at the tier one level, that's that universal level. Um, these students are often considered very high average, but not yet above like the 90th, 97th percentile. Um, these students definitely require um, differentiation and modification, but not to a high degree that would require a plan. 
Um, the tier two level, um, these students meet the threshold of gifted based on testing and the triangulation of data. Um, this happens, the um, modifications and differentiation happens at that classroom level, um, and the teachers would complete a differentiation form that Carrie is going to go over it later, um, and these are completed by classroom teachers. That tier three level is the very advanced gifted level. So these students are at the 99th percentile or above. Um, these students may require like acceleration, independent study. Um, we might even need to use the SST PST process to make sure we have the best programming in place for these students because they need such a higher level of differentiation. Um, again, a differentiation form would be completed for these students as well, and that's documented then throughout their academic career. Through elementary, I should say. Um, uh, starting on page 7, um, it starts to talk about the nomination process and the identification process. So Carrie already mentioned the 5 areas that we look at when we are looking for uh, to see if a student is gifted or talented. Um, and if a student is being referred, they would need at least two nominations. So typically this looks like the classroom teacher or the parent. Um, if it's in the area of creativity, leadership, or any of the visual performing arts, that might also be like an art teacher or a music teacher. Um, we, when we send the nomination form to the parents, they would then give us consent to uh, um, gather any additional information necessary. So this might be uh, individualized testing. Um, it might need to be talking more with the teachers and any other people who are nominating them. Um, and then we have our specific criteria. We made slight changes a few summers ago. Um, and the changes that we made were so that the students who were in tier one didn't require that differentiation form. Um, and the criteria we made sure aligned with similar large districts like ourselves. So this included like Pewaukee, Oconomowoc, Elmbrook. So we looked at their criteria and made sure that we were in, in alignment with them as well. Okay, so the page I'm going to speak to is I'm going to talk about the programming process in grades three through five. I did, sh this is the first page of the differentiation form, but if you go um, to page 15 and 16, you'll see the other pages. Um, differentiation occurs in the classroom by the classroom teachers. Um, teachers do confer with school psychologists, math coaches, um, other people in the building to determine appropriate enrichment activities, curriculum, or other modifications. Um, the SST team, as Stephanie mentioned, can help us, like, if we have needs that well, we just need to kind of put our brains together and think of some other options. Um, differentiation occurs in the classroom by the classroom teachers. Um, for students who are considered advanced gifted, um, we might consider things like Zern math or subject acceleration or some different options. Um, the differentiation form talks about changes that can be made to content, what is learned, um, process how we learn, or product, how we show what we've learned. Uh, the differentiation form is on page 15 of the manual, and it includes different things like modifications, um, think like assignments and curriculum, opportunities to use various thinking skills, and ways to expand learning, such as independent study. Um, the differentiation form is completed in the fall and the spring, and it's completed by the classroom teachers. Um, at Meadowbrook, they're signed and given to parents at those conference conferences. And Stephanie and I have a very similar how we do it. We have um, a Google folder set up that's for all of our GT students, and we have a folder for each student. So we end up sending links to the teachers and then they complete them. So, you know, I am able to look back at all of the students and all of their paperwork and it's all in a folder for us. Um, at the end of the school year, those copies are put in the students' um, cumulative records and they are in the records as the students move up to other grade levels. Okay, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to jump back in um, to talk about gifted and talented program um, in secondary. So this would be in grades um, 6 through 12, which is our middle school and high school levels. So as Carrie was just sharing um, in elementary school, they have the differentiated 
um, forms that are completed by teachers. However, at the secondary level, we don't have any um, forms um, similar to that that we are currently using. Um, it's definitely something um, we may consider utilizing at the middle level um, because what um, I've seen, I'm um, just really looking at programming at the secondary level is high school really takes care of itself, but with middle school, um, there definitely are some pockets of improvement um, around how are we monitoring um, what is actually happening um, in the regular classroom to ensure that this differentiation is happening. So currently at the middle school level, um, similar to at elementary, um, academic needs are met in the regular classroom through differentiated curriculum and instruction. So teachers um, know who their gifted and talented students are and the expectation is they are differentiated instruction for those identified students that they have in their classrooms. With um, sorry, in addition, in middle school, they also have accelerated course offerings and what those course offerings currently are is it's accelerated math 7, um, integrated math 1 and 2, which are both um, high school level courses. So students can start taking those 2 high school level courses in middle school. Um, students can also take biology, which is a high school level course, as well as um, world languages. So they can get a head start on world languages. So going into middle school, they can be ready for those um, higher levels of world languages. So those are the two primary ways that we are providing that programming at the middle school level. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, I definitely do feel um, having some sort of differentiation form at the middle level um, would be something that would be beneficial. When we move to the high school level, again, we, um, as always, we um, meet um, academic needs in the regular classroom through differentiated um, curriculum instruction. However, at the high school level, um, there's um, most of the programming needs are met through um, course offerings. So there is a variety of honors and advanced placement courses um, in grades 9 through 12. So starting in ninth grade, students can be in, say, uh, for example, an honors English 9. Um, they can be in advanced placement human geography as a freshman. Um, so there's many opportunities starting right in freshman year for students um, to have that acceleration and get that um, get their needs met um, outside of just the regular classroom. And again, there's a host of AP classes that students are able to choose from again from the time they enter high school um, through 12th grade. And then we also um, offer dual enrollment um, to our high school students. And this is partnership with some of our um, local um, colleges and universities where our students are actually able to take actual college level classes while they're still in high school. So we have, um, again, many different opportunities at the high school level, in addition um, to just the differentiated um, curriculum and instruction in the classroom. Okay, Waukesha belongs to an organi organization called PAGE, and it stands for Partners for Advancement of Gifted Education. Um, we pay to be members. It's a CISA 1 organization, and I did list the districts that are also members. Uh, Elmbrook, Franklin, Germantown, Grafton, uh, Greendale, Indian Community School, they're all listed there. Um, we meet bi-monthly, and we talk a lot about, like, what's happening in our individual districts, and they plan different um, different things for students who are in the GT program. So what I did was I created a uh, Gmail group, and whenever we get flyers for each of these activities, then I send it to my parents that are, um, are that have students identified as gifted and talented. I also send it to the teachers in the classroom just so they have an awareness, and if they think a student would really benefit, they might bring it up. So some of the things they planned, they've had parent-to-parent -parent seminars, they've had chess nights. Um, we did a virtual trivia night, and it was kind of fun where we had um, different rooms set up, and the, the kids did contests. 
um, Red Oak Writing Workshop. They've had guest speakers. They do book discussions, planetarium night. Uh, they had a painting event. They do virtual presentations, college panel, and there is a comedy sports. It sounds like they're planning. So whenever they have activities, we send an email to the parents. I do have the page website, and that's a hyperlink that you can click on, and they have some pretty good resources. They talk about camps or, you know, other things and um, other things to look at. So to wrap us up, um, just wanted to briefly just touch on just some of our next steps um, as our um, sort of the leadership around GT um, in the district. So just through our work, um, we recognize that some of our um, immediate next steps um, need to focus around um, just getting all of our school psychologists on the same page. So we do have a meeting um, coming up where we will be meeting with all of the um, school psychologists and we will be making sure they're familiar with the updates that have been made to our gifted and talented program guide because we did just make those um, changes this school year. So we just wanna make sure all of our school psychs are following the same protocols and um, we're following the same benchmarks and looking at the same percentiles when we're identifying our students. So we have a meeting coming up where we're going to go over that information with all of our school psychs K-12. Um, we've also discussed the need to streamline and systematize just some of our processes because again, we just recognize that um, even at the elementary um, level that from building to building processes can look different. So although Carrie and Stephanie have very similar processes, the way they do things um, that can look different um, at a different building. And then we also recognize that just over the years, we've onboarded some new um, school psychologists. So we just wanna make sure that um, we have these clear systems and processes in place. So um, regardless if you're a veteran um, school psychologist, you've been here for years, or if you're brand new to our system, you can just come right in and just know um, our systems in the way that you know we do business. Um, also, we plan, um, and this is probably more a lot um, of the work I'll be taking on um, this spring is around just addressing the disproportionality between white students and students of color identified as gifted and talent talented through work with DPI. Um, and through my initial conversations and work with the DPI, I did find out that there is a grant, an annual grant that's available. Um, the grant is the Wisconsin Gifted and Talented Student Education Program Grant. And um, districts that have been identified that have this disproportionality are able to apply for this grant. So it's not just sort of like an open-ended grant, anyone can apply. Um, it's only to districts who have a disproportionality and the goal of this grant is to be able to provide some additional resources to help support um, getting more students of color um, identified, um, possibly providing some additional supports back in schools. And then also part of that grant is to provide opportunities. So Carrie just spoke about opportunities through um, the PAGE partnership, but this grant would also allow us just to do as a district to have some funding just to do some more um, things for our students on site. So these are just some of our immediate next steps, things we'll be working on throughout this school year and into the summer. Um, just wanted to share those um, quickly with you all. So thank you for watching our presentation. Um, the three of us will be live at the teaching and learning um, board meeting on January 3rd. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, um, we will be there and we look forward to seeing you then. So thank you again for your time and attention and we'll see you on the 3rd.